Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to I'm for Fun with me, Dennis Spiegel. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure to have you back with us uh, again today. We've got a tremendous uh, representation. Again, several hundred people uh, listening and viewing, and we have a great guest who I'm going to introduce to you in just a couple of minutes. First, I wanted to start with a couple of the hot topics that are going on uh, here in the United States and really around the world. Uh, first of all, uh, everybody's been watching um, our election. Uh, it's really a, a nail biter, as we know, uh, even at this point in today, uh, the following day of the election. We really don't know uh, who the president of the United States is. It's so close. It's, uh, it's truly a cliffhanger. Um, the uh, when we were getting ready to come on air, uh, it currently stood at electoral votes uh, 238 for uh, Biden and 213 for uh, Donald Trump. <clears throat> and all eyes right now are on Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Nevada uh, to see which way they go. Uh, so at this point in time, uh, we really don't know. They don't know, even though there are a lot of uh, uh, different comments coming out of, of both camps. So we'll be watching it uh, from the standpoint of what's the impact going to be on the economy, uh, both domestically and internationally? Uh, how's this going to affect travel uh, in the short and long term? And uh, to all of us listening and watching, what's the impact going to be on the leisure industry uh, here in the United States and uh, and globally? So uh, we'll be watching it. You'll be watching it. And hopefully this isn't going to go on too long, uh, although they do think it'll be a couple of days before uh, the out, uh, outcome is really known. Uh, a couple of uh, other hot issues that I just really wanted to touch on quickly is uh, we've seen a uh, current spikes and some shutdowns as a result of COVID, uh, particularly over in Europe, uh, especially in the UK, uh, which has had uh, now the highest death toll in Europe as it relates to COVID. Uh, November, on November 5th here, new, new restrictions went in uh, to England to uh, uh affect the and ha help to avoid the national uh, uh, prolonged lockdown. So we're, we're going to see how those types of things work uh, as, as they're implemented. Um, the other uh, hot topic that I wanted to touch on uh, goes back to the West Coast out to California. Uh, we know that uh, the parks out there still are not open um, under the guidelines that have been set up by uh the governor in the state of California. Uh, it's just really been uh, uh, horrendous for, for our industry and, and our operators out there. Um, the um, day before yesterday, eight mayors from largest cities across California uh, wrote a letter to Governor Newsom asking him to reconsider uh, the state's reopening guidelines for the theme parks, which uh, everyone feels are, are just uh, unrealistic and, uh, and, and, and uncalled for. Uh, the letter said that the guidelines were concerning, uh, were concerning as, uh, as they are. They wanted to ask him to push for the reopening of the large theme parks and the medium and the small as quickly as they can, because as we know, it's affecting uh, billions of dollars in revenue and thousands upon thousands of jobs. So uh, we'll see. I'm, I would imagine after the election, we'll probably hear some uh, uh, some results as uh, the governor reacts to that that letter from the mayors. Uh, there is a concerted effort uh, pushing out there, no question about it. So uh, with that said, I uh, want to get to our uh, our guest today. A longtime friend of mine, uh, Jane Cooper. Uh, Jane is uh, 
uh, has agreed to join us today and share some of her thoughts, personal thoughts, and some of her thoughts as the uh, president and chief uh, operating officer of the Hershen Family Entertainment Parks, one of the great operating uh, park groups in our industry. Uh, you know their parks, and Jane's going to talk about these in a minute. Uh, Jane and I go way back to Kings <laughs> Island. <laughs> Jane, and, Jane started uh, as a seasonal employee, like a lot of us in the industry back at Kings Island. Uh, I think it was around 1972, and uh, she moved through um, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, positions in, in the company, rising to uh, the president and CEO of the Paramount Parks. Uh, where she was for quite a time and had quite an impact on those parks, positive impact, and, uh, and then um, moved over to the Hershen uh, organization, as I say, one of the finest organizations in our industry, uh, just a, a great group of people and a great group of parks. So Jane, I want to welcome you. Thank, uh, you. thank you for coming on today. Uh, Give us a couple of minutes. Tell us a little bit more about your background. I gave the macro. Give us a little more deeper dive, if you would. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to uh, uh, tune in here and listen to what Dennis and I have to say. And I can actually remember my second day as a seasonal employee at Kings Island meeting Dennis. He was at the front gate and I believe he had a light blue or a white suit on. It was one of those moments still captured in my brain. So yes, light, we light go, blue. <laughs> we go, we go way back. Um, you know, Dennis, Dennis shared a bit about um, I spent a lot of years with the Paramount organization. I'm currently with um, Person Family Entertainment. And, you know, I did spend a couple of years working with Rene Aziz on his role-playing theme park, um, Want to Do. And one of the things I share with people when you think about your career and what you've done is I've lived on the East Coast, I've lived on the West Coast, I lived in the Midwest, I've lived in the South. So I think you become so much um, a, a compilation of all of your different experiences. I've had really good years. I've had really, really bad years. And um, one thing I also share is most of, you, you learn a lot from those difficult years and difficult experiences. And while I wouldn't want to repeat them, I wouldn't trade any of them for anything. So I began my career in the retail environment. So I probably sometimes chime in on what merchandise or food should be, but I also realized that after all these years, you know, I, 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 most of my people know a heck of a lot more than I do, but I've been around, around the block and uh, currently with Person Family Entertainment, which Dennis, I so appreciate you acknowledging what a great company it is with such a great culture and great people. Um, I've spent 15 years here, it's been great. Um, we, a lot of people would be familiar with our operations in Branson, Silver Dollar City. We have a dinner theater. We have a water park. Um, we manage Dollywood for Dolly in Pigeon Forge. We had several operations there. We added a uh, Dream More Resort Hotel five years ago, which has been incredibly successful. Um, we have a couple of aquariums, one near Dennis in uh, Newport, Kentucky. And we also have the Harlem Globetrotter. So while yeah. our portfolio has a lot of similarities, there's a little bit of differences in, in that as well. That's so. great diversity, Jane. I mean, mm -hmm. it really is. And I would imagine that pays off in different uh, economic times and weather periods, sure. et cetera. So. Yeah, we kind of think about the balance between indoor operations and outdoor operations. So while theme parks never want bad weather, the aquariums love it when it rains. So it's well, nice balance. One of, one of the things I want to touch on later, I left out purposely, is Jane was uh, chairman of IAPA, the International yep. Association of Amusement Parks, did a wonderful job of leading the organization, uh, participating uh, uh, in the strategic long-range planning and a lot of different areas. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but I just, I, I wanted to okay. get that in. Yeah. 
you Great did a experience. wonderful job and one of the few women we've had at the helm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations on that. Well, thank you. Uh, Jane, do, do us a favor. Uh, we're, we've got a lot to move through. We're already getting some questions coming in here. So uh, we kind of go back and forth. But why don't you give us a little overview of uh, and tell us how how things have been at Hershen. I mean, you know, you've got all these different properties that you that you talked about. You've got indoor, you've got outdoor. Uh, who's been the hardest hit? What have you seen? What have you learned? Kind of give us a couple of. Well, I'll share share a little bit here, even of kind of my thinking. You know, I think if you look, we all know how to deal with crisis and difficult situations. We deal with you know millions of people every year. But I think this whole um, COVID experience is dramatically different than what any of us have experienced just in thinking about the duration. And nobody really knows what's going to happen, when it's going to end, where it's going to go. So I think if you think about back in April or May or March or April, when we first were in lockdown, I don't think anybody would have said, oh. OK, <laughs> on November 4th, we're going to be still sitting here and things might even be worse. So I think that is very challenging for businesses. And it's also a challenge, I think, personally, for all of our employees to deal with. I mean, the amount of fatigue, this is truly a marathon, not a sprint. We know how to execute. We know how to make plans, but the plan changes every week. So I think that's been a challenge. One of the things I try to articulate to people is, you need to be flexible, you need to be adaptable, and you need to be fast. Um, you, can, you can see different personalities respond to all of this differently. Um, yeah. And, and I, think, I think taking the time to recognize that people have anxiety and they're nervous and dealing with it in a different, in a different way is, is really helpful to help people get through it. So I think of course, for all of us from a business point of view, as soon as we shut down, we were all trying to figure out how to get back up. What, when were we going to be able to be uh, reopened and what were the parameters going to be to reopening? So I can honestly tell you, we probably met every other day with a different plan and making sure we could move our businesses forward. I think the closer we got to the real opportunity to open up, uh, you know, our, our lens has always been first about the company. We want to give a great experience to our guests. We are a great place to work for great people. And we have a culture of leading with love and serving others. So that was always our lens as we decided what to do moving forward. And then of course, safety first. So, and Most Jane, have you have you seen with the with the different types of properties? Has there been some compensating balances that have helped uh, the situation? Yeah, but you know, I I would say it's very interesting. From the time we opened, the properties had very very similar experiences in terms of what the level of demand was, mm -hmm. the issues that consumers had anxiety about, how consumers responded. So. Um, you know, number one, from a safety point of view, obviously putting in all of the all of the protocols, we limited capacity, everyone has to wear a mask, you need sanitizing stations, everybody gets their temperature taken. So those things are universal. You know, we try to always do the same thing across all um, properties. So, you know, it took a little energy to get comfortable with that. I think I think the guests have been very um forgiving and very accommodating. Um, the, the one thing I would suggest to everybody is really do some research and understand what, how consumers feel. I mean, currently about a third of customer or consumers are comfortable traveling. There's 50% of them that are not going to go out until there's a vaccine or pr really proven therapies. Yeah. And then there's some that are on the fence. So understand you know, what, what your real marketplace is going to be. Jane, as we got deeper into the season after the early closures mm -hmm. and things started to reopen, uh, did you see a, a strong uh, comeback did, or did, was it 
slowly ramped up? What was your experience with your different attractions in relation to the people, the visits? Um, you know, it started probably slower than most of us would have expected. But mm -hmm. every month it has gotten better and better and better and continues to move in a positive direction. You know, one of the heritages of Person Family Entertainment is our festivals and events. So we do a fall harvest pumpkin event, which just ended obviously um, last weekend. And so far, October has been our strongest month. Starting this weekend, we will open Christmas Great. and we typically do really well for Christmas. So little by little, people are getting out more and more. Now, Take you a know, property who knows like what's gonna happen with the new spike in, in cases, I'm not sure. Yeah, let, let's, yeah, exactly. Let's yeah. take uh, Dollywood for a second, mm -hmm. located in the Smokies and mm -hmm. Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg area. Um, that's a huge Christmas venue, mm -hmm. that whole area, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So do you, will you uh, be allowed, or not allowed, but will you actually hitchhike on that, the people that are coming in there and really promote sure. that heavily? Sure. I mean, the big, you know, one of the big drivers of the Pigeon Forge marketplace is the Great Smoky Mountains. And yeah. when you think about COVID and the challenges, people want to be outdoors. People that want to travel are more apt to drive than fly. So if you think about our markets, Branson and Pigeon Forge, they're big drive markets. So I think that we're bound to see a little bit better performance than some of the parks that are really more destination oriented. So yeah, that, that has been our experience to date. I wondered that, yeah. yeah. Uh, let me, let me, we're gonna grab some questions as sure. we kind of talk. Uh, here's sure. one from Peter in Florida. He said, what capital plans or expansion plans did Hershen have on the table that have either been postponed, delayed or maybe even canceled? Well, I think an interesting thing when you look at 2020, because the season was so shortened and so people really didn't get to experience things, most of our projects that were on the boards for 20, we are opening in 21. So the way we look at it is, you know, we've pushed things about two years out, obviously, from a financial point of view. Um, you know, we don't want to spend quite as much on capital until... Mm -hmm. Nobody the, is it, until the business is restored. And quite frankly, I don't, I don't, I don't think you're going to get the return and I don't think it's, you know, the right time, but obviously we're continuing to plan what we're going to do in the future. And, and that's a, that's a point I think that we have, that I would emphasize to most people is if you think about our business, you know, we're all, there's never enough resources. There's never enough time and there's never enough money. No. <laughs> so you look at being put on pause like this, it really gives you an opportunity to kind of rethink things. Are, should we still be doing all the things we're doing? Is there a way to be more efficient, more effective? Um, you know, so we're trying to do that. Take advantage, take advantage of the time out there um, and the reset. So, Well, we've said uh, on our podcast and internally and with some of our clients that we're all familiar with zero-based budgeting. Every few years, we have to go back to that process and as trite as it may sound. But I think we're really in a zero-based planning exactly. mode now throughout exactly. the globe, around the world industry. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we have to, as you say, take advantage of that. Here, here comes another uh, question, Jane, if you don't mind. This is from Sandra. It says, <clears throat> Jane, could you please talk a little bit about customers' behaviors during the pandemic and how these changing behaviors impact your analytics of the operation? Are they spending more? Are they utilizing reservations, buying uh, date-specific tickets, et cetera? That's a, it's a really good question. Um, we have found that consumers have shifted their behavior. Obviously, we all have capacity limitations. So unlike how we used to do business, you really want people to make, to make reservations and plans to come because you have a limited amount of space. So at our aquariums, we do <clears throat> time ticketing and 100% reservations. So we have found that we are sold out every weekend, 
during the week, a little less so, but people have really adapted. At the bigger theme parks, a little less. You know, we'll say reservations are recommended, they're not required. But as Christmas gets closer and we get busier, we will probably go out with a different message. So we've also found that people um, that are coming are spending a lot more money. Not only are they buying full price tickets because we're not doing discount, a lot of promotions, mm -hmm. um, they are spending a lot more money on food and a lot more money on merchandise. And you know, years ago at Paramount, we used to say, hey, wouldn't it be great if we can get 20, 20 percent more out of each consumer that comes and we could do less volume it, it's it's really interesting to see and it is it is held very steady um our our uh, merchandise operations are probably up 20 percent over budget on a per capita wow. basis. so it does impact um what you're doing and you know i think the key is trying to understand why is that is it because there's less people and maybe they're waiting in line. I, <clears throat> I happen to think one of the issues is people are committing ahead of time. They're buying their tickets online ahead of time. So they've made that financial commitment. So when they come, they feel like they're more apt to spend. I Jane, think another- are, are you using contactless in some of the we venues? Are. Yes, okay. as much as possible. So, Which, so I can go up Mm -hmm. buy my Coke or my pizza or whatever online and pick it up. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, it, we're, we're, we're varying different levels de depending on the property, sure. Sure. which would <clears throat> brings me to another point As I see what's happening. Um, I would suggest really digging in and spending money on technology and pushing your technology faster and faster. Um, yeah. A, a technology can help us not only on the contactless side, but it can help, um, you know, from a whole experiential point of view, from a consumer point of view. So we're always pushing technology, but when you're open all the time and you're busy, it gets a little challenging. Well, we'll do that next year. So I think there's an opportunity to really push forward. First of all, you get better data. And second of all, you can do it with the contactless thing. And third of all, you might be able to do it with less labor. Okay, she's got a follow up here. She says, "Okay." <laughs> she said, "Thank you for that." <laughs> do you do you think that buying ahead? And I assume she's speaking to advanced reservations. Do you think that's going to become the norm? Totally. Well, you know, I liken it to I think back to um, I don't know how many years ago it was. You you go to a movie like when we were you know young. You just walked up, and I remember when they started doing. Fandango and buy ahead of time and thinking, yeah. well, why would you do that? You just walk in and do it. But now I can't imagine going to a movie without right. making a reservation, buying a ticket ahead of time. So I think more and more people are used to that. And the more we can do that, and this may give us a faster adaptation of it, I think it can really impact our business. When you think about we're in the volume business, which is, you know, we make more money on right. the last hundred thousand than the first, but the cost associated with those peaks and valleys from a staffing and a operational point of view, you can certainly give a consumer a better experience when it's more planned. And uh, that's the other thing I, I would, to, to Sandra's point, our, our guest scores and our guest experience are higher rated than they've ever been. Really? Yeah. Now, wow. the, and, and the one thing we've done, which I would suggest too, is we ask additional questions all about our safety protocols and we get you know really strong scores on the safety protocols and the better the, the scores are there the higher the guest satisfaction so yeah. but understanding how people feel about that um you know an area of, of controversy i'm sure for some is the whole concept of masks we require masks the whole time you're at any one of our properties um and I think since we opened in June, there's been much more of a, you know, a lot of the municipalities are requiring them anyway. So it's been a little easier to get people to adapt to that. Um, but you, mm -hmm. that, and they will, they will say in their surveys that, you know, knowing that masks are required may let them know they should be comfortable coming, so. 
Well, uh, we know the consumers have given the operators a lot of grace uh, mm -hmm. during during the pandemic, and uh, uh, we've had to adjust the programming, the operating schedules, uh, uh, as you know, and as, as you and I have talked about. Uh, how how do you see some of those things continuing on in the future, uh, particularly as it's as it's related to? the overall experience and the, and the revenue for the company. Right. Well, I, you know, as you said, we, we've adjusted a lot and the consumers have given us a lot of grace, not only on the schedule, but on what the programming is. We're not, we don't have no. any indoor shows. We don't have many indoor facilities open. Um, I think moving forward, you want your volume to get to a point before you add all of that, not the programming, but the scheduling. So we're looking at, do we publish schedules on a monthly basis? Do we see where demand is? Um, again, it's a balance between communicating and making sure people understand what you're doing so they don't show up and you've changed something dramatically. And I think that brings up another point. I think that <clears throat> making sure your data and your websites and everything are really, really current and all the information is there, um, I would say another thing we've experienced is the amount of volume on our call centers is incredible. We have added a lot more people to answer folks' questions and make them feel comfortable. And, yeah. you know, it's really difficult when you can't talk to a human. And when everything's changed, you know, I think we get a lot of credit for always having people answer the phones. Now, you know, at times we're overloaded, but we really monitor the questions and what guests are looking for. Here comes one, Jane, from Thomas <laughs> in uh, jolly old England, okay? He Ooh. said, Jane, could you tell us about the capacity constraints operators are facing now all around the world? He says, how has that impacted your business and what's going to be the norm for the future as it relate to as it relates to volume it's, it's a it's a really he's saying yeah it's a, it, it's a really good question um you know we we did a whole analysis of the amount of space that we had and how do you make sure that there's there's enough walking space and everybody can properly social distance so we did an awful lot of analysis mm -hmm. on that <clears throat> on just the number of people that could walk around. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, when you think about social distancing, if you can't properly social distance on a ride, you have to limit the capacity on the ride. Um, right. we have, we've used plexiglass and things like that, and we're trying to, to move it forward a little bit. But I think until we get to a different point, that's going to be required. So then the, then the question I think for all of us becomes, if I can only do 50% of my volume, can I have, do I have a business model that will be profitable? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that we looked at certainly 2020 moving forward, while you'd like to be profitable, our goal originally was, we just want to make sure we, we can break even, that we mm -hmm. can pay our bills, pay our, pay our folks, offer a great guest experience and live to fight another day. So <laughs> uh, you have to, you have to build the model. Can you yeah. do it? And, and, and you listen to some of these restaurants that are limited to 25%. I think a lot of them can't, they can't break even at 25%. We're going to see 40% of those small restaurants. They're going to go. Yeah. Oh, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another one uh, just came in. This is from Jim. He says, Jane, with the noted in with the noted inability <laughs> to predict the end of COVID, in the COVID impact, is there a different strategy for capital planning beyond the discussed reduced amounts or investment? For example, is there some sort of rolling review occurring on a regular basis in your company? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And one, one thing I would say- That's a say, great question. That, that it is, is a great, really good question. Yeah. I would say too, is are there during COVID, are there other capital projects that you could do that were not 
previously on the board, so to speak, that fit in better now from a timing point of view. You think about one of the things, uh, if you think about the aquariums, we do a ton of business in school groups. Well, obviously there's no school groups book, booking. So we're doing a lot of virtual events. But the other thing is think about parents with all these kids at home, trying to teach them online, which is like mind numbing to me. Can we package and say, okay, we'll take a group of, you know, 20, 20 parents and 20 kids, and we'll put you in a, a limited space. We can do some educational stuff, but they can be absolutely confident that they're not going to be exposed because the group is going to be smaller. And does that then lead you to, are there other things you can do from a capital point of view that work with smaller groups of people that will really help you? But, but we review, we probably review capital every couple of weeks. Every is this what we need to do? And, and we're doing, as I said earlier, one of our issues is can we move faster on technology? than we were before. Yeah, uh, hitchhiking on that. This is Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia from uh, Paris, France. She said, uh, as you have just mentioned, especially the aquariums and the museums, mm -hmm. and uh, how can, I gotta take on my glasses, assist in the education, how can this assist in the educational experience through virtual programming? And are you going to be doing more of that at some of your projects in the future? Absolutely. We do have a virtual program at both of the aquariums at this point. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's kind of an obvious connection with the animals, but I think we will continue to do that. Are we going to look at it broadly in the future? I, I, I don't know. I think we'd probably look more at how do we do smaller group events at the bigger parks that can become educational? I'm, I'm sure so many people are familiar with, we used to do math days, physics days, all of those things around the roller coasters. That doesn't mean you can't still do those things um, on a smaller basis. You don't open the whole park, but how can you think differently about giving people access to your product in a little different form and fashion. Jane, let's uh, let's shift gears here a little bit because we're getting a lot of questions and there's a couple of things okay. I want to get to you. I know one of uh, one of your great patients has been, and we talked about this, the talent, the young mm -hmm. people who mm -hmm. who work for us and are coming up through the ranks. So, uh, and Hershen, uh, as we know, was named one of the Atlanta's top workplaces recently uh, for 2020. Uh, and so congratulations on that. But uh, what, what are you doing in your organization to protect, grow, and uh, develop these young people who want to come into the industry? Because during this, hell, it's hard to keep people who are on the payrolls right now, let alone bringing people in. Well, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. And, you know, one thing I always tell people is you really need two things to be successful. One, you need to know your market, know your customer, know your market. And the second thing you need to do is you need to have the right people on your team and on your bus. So I think that's true of every business. So obviously it's, it's true through all of this. Um, what a couple of things we've done, and I, I, I think a tenant that everybody needs to do is communicate, 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 and be incredibly transparent. Um, yeah. Obviously, we had a lot of people furloughed for a couple of months. We did a weekly newsletter that went to every single employee. We added videos. We told them what was going on. We told them what the latest information was. And that, I think, really helped keep yeah. them engaged. So you got to communicate with them. Yeah, you, 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 you can never over communicate. Um, I think another another thing, just from a leadership point of view, I mean, we, we've all had good days and bad days through this. But at the end of the day, you have to send the right message that you're optimistic about the future. And this is a place you want to be. 
You can't walk around as a leader with, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, because they're watching every single thing you're doing. And if you're sending those kind of signals, they're like, okay, I'm out. So <laughs> as much as, I mean, that's true no matter when you're, you're doing business, but I do think now it's even more important. And, and you know, one, one thing, everybody has had compensation challenges. A lot of people have cut yeah. salaries for a certain period of time and some have been restored and some haven't and all of that. So I think while most people understand that while they're going through it and they want the company to survive and are supportive, I think you need to give them a pathway back and you need to say, okay, nobody's gonna get a bonus in 2020, obviously. Well, what's the plan? Could I get one in 2020? And are you going to change the requirements? And I, you know, I, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, they they're just lucky to have a job. Oh no, yeah. don't ever, don't ever think that. <laughs> don't ever think that. We have lost um, some people that are more what I would call technical experts. You know, finance person can go find a job anywhere. An IT person can go do that. So. Yeah, I think you, you, you really have to stay engaged and continue to communicate. Um, Do you have a team, work, Jane, that's focusing directly on that uh, from a corporate standpoint, or is that being done individually? Is well, what we do back. is we have a template that we use for the overall company communication every week, and then we'll do a company message. Then every property adds stuff, depending on what's you know, current in their place. So every property chief, as we call them, all puts content in. We do, we do business pieces. We do personal pieces. You know, somebody's had this issue. Somebody achieved something. We do inspirational things. We do all sorts of things. We try to be very balanced. It's not just about the business. We mm -hmm do a lot that says, if you have a question, you know, think about all the issues surrounding employee benefits through all of this with people being furloughed. And so we publish all these phone numbers every week. We do a feature on here's who you talk to. So it seems to have been fairly, fairly effective. Um, well, I know the Hershen organization and have known going back to Pete and Jack 50 years ago and uh, inspiration has always been the hallmark of mm -hmm of your organization. And uh, I know that's been carried forward. And I, I wondered if that was paying Absolutely. dividend now. I, I thought it was. Absolutely. A couple of more questions are rolling in here. Okay. Pam, scroll down there so I can see that. It says, uh, we assume that Dollywood and Silver Dollar City have a lot of older team members who may mm -hmm. not feel comfortable working. And the stimulus has paid higher than employees may be making. Do you shift team members between properties or teaming with other attractions to allow all aspects of the attractions to remain open? So are you playing a little bit of checkers on the- Not, not necessarily from property but to property, but certainly within. And, and you know, our, you know we, are, we are very um, conscious and we really, one of our objectives is to be a great place to work for great people. So through this process, Anybody that was employed that was furloughed and we said, we'd like you to come back. If they didn't want to come back and they didn't feel comfortable for safety or they had issues, their job is waiting for them when they choose to come back. So nobody has been, it, it, and there's no negative consequences if you don't want to come back. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, no, it, it's been great. And I think, you know, because of the culture and because we do we work hard at taking care of each other a lot of the employees they, they want the company to be successful they want things to work so we've had a pretty good response to helping out so to speak um but something you you said earlier when you talk when we talked about changing the capacity and changing the times and so forth we have limited the hours a little bit which has helped with staffing but we we could use more employees and you know, some did not choose to come back because they were getting the $600. Well, that, that's a good segue into this next question. The next question actually is from China, uh, Sujay, and he asked, is the visa program still in effect in America 
that hired people from Asia and Eastern Europe, or has it been stopped? I think that's permanently. I don't think I it's think been stopped permanently, but there aren't any this year. It, yeah. We would all like the J1 program to continue. So yeah, how, it's how has that made a big you? difference? It's, it's made a big difference. Um, I think if we were trying to run at full capacity, we'd be really, really challenged um, because yeah. we have no J1s, no international students, just what the local markets have available. So it's, it's been challenging. Okay, here's one from Gabby and it says, looking at your seasonal hiring for 2021, what kind of impact do you expect on hiring and staffing process for next year? I assume the hiring will be done with virtual tools to interview and hire your staff, question mark. Absolutely. I think the other thing, as I said in the beginning, um, we have to be flexible and adaptable. So typically, you know, you'd be thinking about when we're going to open, how many people we need, so forth. So we're trying to collapse the window a little bit so that we have real information and we know what we're going to open and what we're not and we're going to mm -hmm. know on the timing. So, uh, you know, we, we've been trying to work, in, work on making the hiring process simpler and more streamlined for a couple of years. So this has made it, made us jump a little quicker into that. But, you know, you, you don't want to typically, you know, you do budgets now and you have it all figured out and that's what you're yeah. going to do. You, you, you can't do that because you, I mean, you can do it, but you may have to do the work rework three or four times. So again, we're trying to stay as flexible as we can and see what happens in the first quarter. Um, you know, is, is there a vaccine? Does the virus go down? Are there therapeutics? You know, we're thinking that, you know, through the second quarter, at least, we're going to be under the same restrictions we are now. Here's another good question. Okay. Uh, they're rolling in here, Jane, and we're, we're probably not going to get the, all of them. I'm looking over here at the clock, but we'll give these to you. And maybe you can answer them, send them back. We'll put them in our news, which we've done with Happy our, to do. our Happy previous to do guests. That. Uh, mm -hmm. This one is, <clears throat> how important is the season pass program to the Hershen Family Entertainment Parks? Uh, we have seen it grow exponentially in Six Flags and at uh, Cedar Fair and even Disney and Universal. Is it an important part of your portfolio? Really good question. And and pass. Abs <laughs> absolutely. It is a very important part of our portfolio. And I'm glad somebody asked this question um, because, you know, we're selling passes right now for 21. So we had an awful lot of passes sold um, before we were shut down in mm -hmm. March. So understanding the implications to the program and to the consumers. And what we have done basically is extended the time their pass is valid. So we were fortunate. We opened all of our parks in, in uh, June. So anybody who bought a pass that was supposed to be for 2020, that pass is now good through June of 2021. Um, we have- a, Are all the benefits the same with that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And so what we're doing now, which is kind of interesting back to responding and understanding people's behavior, we're selling what we call an extension. So if your pass is good through June, we do, you know, we have very popular fall and Christmas events. You can buy an upgrade to your pass that's good through June from June until the end of the year. So... Mm -hmm. One of the questions I have mm -hmm. as, a, as it mm -hmm. relates to this, and I look at the industry broadly, and uh, I was talking with uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, Gary Walks, who was mm -hmm. the, uh, the person who started all the Kings Parks, which yeah. are now the yeah. Paramount Parks, yeah. or, or were the Paramount Parks, and now owned by Cedar Fair. And Gary was asking the other day, uh, how do the parks that have... Uh, have these programs, season pass programs, uh, and have given this benefit extended into the next season, how are they going to compensate for that loss of revenue uh, in 2021? 
Well, I, I think it, it, you know, you just have to kind of go according to the, to the plan. So the way we do it is, you know, they paid for their pass in 20. We do it based on their visitation. So while mm -hmm. we have their money, we're not going to account for as much revenue in 20 as we really collected. Some of that's going to be rolled to 21. But just like anything, it's going to have an impact on, sure. on your business. But I would say that season pass holders are, for the most part, your loyal consumers. So just like we talked earlier about communicating with your employees and keeping them engaged, we've done the same thing with our season pass holders. We've had a whole plan Excellent. and a whole program, you know, and it's difficult, especially difficult in April and May. Well, we don't know when we're going to open. And then we, we did do refunds. We have done a fair amount of refunds. So if you decided you bought your pass, but you weren't going to come, even though we were open because you didn't feel safe, we gave you your money back. If you just decided I'm not going to use it, I want a refund. We gave, we gave you your money back. So we've been flexible. Mm -hmm. um, with how we've dealt with it, really, because we want that loyal base to be with us in the future. Uh, it, it's it's a challenge to figure out how to deal with it. Well, when you and I were at Kings Island, I'm going back a while, okay, before Paramount, okay, when mm -hmm. it was still the Taft Parks, mm -hmm. uh, we looked at our attendance by ticket type segment, and we had a la carte, which was roughly 30% of the attendance. Right. We had group sales, churches, clubs, organizations, which was in the 30%. And we had promotions, which was about the same thing. That was the McDonald's or Coca-Cola. Yeah. And that was about 30%. When the season pass came in, it started, for lack of a better word, cannibalizing some of these other programs. Uh, a la carte in most parks now is down around one and a half to two percent. Uh, we are a market up, market down industry, as we know, and people don't pay full price. But the season pass in some of the companies now it has eclipsed 50% and approaching 60% as uh, the aggregate total of, of attendance. So uh, do you think there, there could be too many eggs in one basket? Not, not, necess not necessarily. It depends. It depends how you want to do it. I mean, you know, if you think about a season pass holder on a per visit basis, you may not get the same level of spending as you do from an all cart. But overall, I mean, we have season pass holders that, have, that buy pass every year and have been buying them for 10 or 15 years, and they actually spend more. One thing we've had a lot of success with in the last couple of years is what we call premium passes. People mm -hmm. want access. And I think that's a, a learning from COVID as well. If you can give them a premium experience where they, you know, whether it's a fast pass or a do a back of the house tour or let me in front and those kind of things, they're really, mm -hmm. will, they're really willing to, to pay for that. So our kind of top tier season pass has a really, a really healthy price on it and yet mm -hmm. they're very loyal the more you give them we talk to them a lot we understand what they want and a big thing that people want is access they don't want to wait in line they want to know how to pre-order and for that you know they want to park at the front and for that you can buy a premium pass and get access to all sorts of things so. one of the questions just came in as you're talking said do you uh, finance the passes like some of the other organizations or is it borne by the guest um, we have payment plans, you, you do. know, okay. so yeah, depend, depending on when you buy your pass, mm -hmm. a payment plan, you know, what six pay monthly for six months or three months or whatever. It's a little different at each park and at each time frame, but obviously we focus on the earliest commitment. So the earlier you commit, the better payment options you have, mm -hmm. the better price you have and the better ben benefits you get. Here's another question. Uh, the, the question is, which of the pandemic restrictions, we're back to COVID again, okay, yeah. and safety protocols, uh, do you think will continue into 2021 and beyond? Well, I think everything we're doing right now will certainly extend until there's a vaccine and people are more comfortable. So I yeah. would say everything we're doing, temperature checks, masking, sanitizing, social distancing is 
here through the second quarter. Will things start to relax? It depends. It depends when there's a, a vaccine or a therapy. So I would plan on the conservative side as opposed to hoping that it's going to be gone. Yeah. Good think answer. about where we were in yeah. April and May, right? We didn't yeah, exactly. here in November. So, you know, yeah. we may even be, you know, second quarter may not even matter. It may be, it could be 22, but yeah. be flexible and don't make all the sense. audibles when needed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And don't, you know, typically in this business, especially on the seasonal properties, you, you spend the winter and you, you do a lot of work, you do maintenance, you plan everything, you get everybody trained, you do your media plans, you buy all your supplies, um, you know, and we're trying to kind of, you know, extend that so we're not mm -hmm. all, we haven't spent everything before we open not knowing what we're doing. And that's a little challenging for some of the properties to think about, you know, well, how am I going to get this done if I can't bring all these people in and do it right now? But you want to make sure that you have the resources and you have when the business is there. So exactly. a, a little uncomfortable for people, but we're getting there. Yeah, we, we, we've we got to make those adjustments on a minute by minute basis. Here's sure. another question from Antonio. He said, regarding the maintenance of attractions, how has the pandemic modified your programs? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that we are still doing the same amount of work as we always did. I think that because we were closed, we got a little bit more done. Um, but the other thing I would say is think about ride cycles. And when you've been closed for three months and you're doing a lot and you're doing a lot less volume, the amount of cycles and the amount of wear and tear is probably a little bit less on some things. We're trying to stretch, but remember, we always do safety first. So we're not, yeah. you know, we're doing all the, all the ride stuff, but maybe we're not painting the buildings the way we were planning originally. Maybe we're pushing that off a little bit. But in terms of the safety and security, that's- Yeah, that doesn't that, change. That doesn't that change. Doesn't change. And I mean, I think another thing to think about is when you think about all these safety protocols for that you need for COVID, there's a real cost to all of this. And, you know, I mean, from a staffing point of view, to do all the temperature checks, you know, to do, you know, buy all the sand. Cleaning, it, it, disinfecting. It's, everything. it's a big, yeah. it's a big nut and it's not going to go away. No, that's, that's with us to stay. I've, I've told a lot of people, and I think I've said it on previous podcasts, but I'll say it with you. Um, we lived a certain way before 911, and after right. that, our lives right. changed. Right. And some things went back to the way it was yep. as it related to travel. Others have stayed the same. Stayed. And 20 mm -hmm. plus years later, we're still uh, feeling that impact and implementing and uh, and uh, working with those those issues. So I think the same thing is definitely true. Jane, but when I like to I like to tell people, don't think about going back to normal. There's going to be a whole new normal and there's opportunities within that and try to think about the glasses half full not half empty and and question why you've been doing what you've been doing is it still the right thing to do is it still required and it's really interesting things that'll pop up that well we've done it that way for 10 years because nobody yeah. ever asked the question so that can be kind of energizing i think for some of the some of the team members, because I mean, going out there and working in these environments, you know, all day and dealing with consumers that maybe don't want to wear a mask and de dealing with all these protocols can be a little bit exhausting. So you need to find ways to let's use our creative energy. Let's be innovators. What can we do? I find that interesting. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And uh, as you say, you've got to keep moving with them and educating them on that. And you'll get some of your best ideas from them. Absolutely. That's what Absolutely. Comes back. Absolutely. Jane, a couple, couple of things. We're, mm -hmm. we're going to run out of time here and we've got a few more questions. One of the things that I wanted to uh, talk with you about just briefly is, as I said at the top of the podcast, you've been very involved with IAPA. You've served on uh, hundreds of committees and led a lot of the, a lot of the programs, uh, uh, very, uh, very well done. Uh, one of the things that uh, 
actually came in was what happened to the foundation? <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is, is that a, uh, it says you were an inter integral part of it. Can you fill us in on what's going on with the, uh, with this program? Is it here or gone? <laughs> so I, I, I have no idea really. I, uh, okay, well, the, I'll, I'll tell you what I know at this moment, and a lot may have changed okay. since that. The, okay. the foundation, the foundation still exists, and the function of the foundation is to work on giving scholarships to interested students that want to enter the industry. Um, a couple of the other pieces of what we were doing the education committee is working on, you know, do we want to partner with junior achievement? Do we want to have other education pieces? But the foundation is very focused on giving scholarships. And, you know, we had a, a whole group that we were giving out for the expo this year, obviously, since the expo didn't happen, mm -hmm. um, we didn't do that. But there's lots of Lots of people want to come to the expos. They want to, whether it's, you know, a college class or coming to the expo, we still sponsor all that. Jim Shea is currently the uh, chairman. So. Who? No. <laughs> and nobody's asking for money right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure Jim's happy you put that plug in. There you go. Him. There you go. <laughs> Look, we're, we've got time for one more question and this is a fun one. Okay. okay. <laughs> and I, I wish I thought of this. It's, it, this comes in from Japan. <laughs> Are you ready? It says, <laughs> Miss, Miss Cooper. What is Dolly Parton like? And is she as much fun as she seems to be to work with? Is she a good uh, partner? <laughs> that is a really good question. And I'm happy to answer that. Dolly Parton is the most authentic person that I have ever done business with. She is exactly who you would like her to be. She says exactly what she's going to do. And she never, she is an incredible partner. She knows what her skill set is versus us. She's very pleasant to deal with. And her, she is so engaged and caring about not only all of our teams, but the business. So she is, out of anybody I've ever worked for, she's the best. Well, I've got a question. With. I've got a question for yeah. you on that one. Uh, does Ted Miller, is he still working with her? Do you know Ted? Yes, he is. He is. Mm -hmm. Ted was, uh, when I entered the industry and went to my first IAAPA convention in Chicago 50 years ago this year, Ted was there and he, he was working with a small park down in Kentucky at that time. I believe it was River Bend or uh, mm -hmm. Beach, Beach Bend, something like that. And uh, he and I became friends and I still get a a Christmas card Aww. through the years from Ted and Dolly signed it. And I'm yeah, sure, yeah. sure you did too. Uh, yeah. And he introduced me to her one time. We had lunch together and uh, I fell in love right there. She's <laughs> great. I mean, she's she was great. amazing. She, yeah. she was fantastic. Yeah. Well, Jane, I want to, I want to thank you so much. It's uh, it's been a really fast hour. We've got a whole scrolling board of questions, which will catch up with you on. I want to thank you. I want to oh, thank, thank you. the Persian organization for being who they are, doing what they do, and uh, just being one of the wonderful uh, organizations in our industry. Uh, I, I like to end up every, uh, every podcast telling our, our viewers and listeners that, uh, you know, if, if we can't have fun, how can we sell it? And uh, that's kind of the name of wherever that is back there. I'm for fun. <laughs> that's been my license plate for 48 years. And the other thing is we work in a, in a great industry. Uh, we don't put smoke in the skies and we, we don't contaminate the streams like we read about every day. What we really do is we put smiles on people's faces and we make memories. We create that, memories worth repeating. And what could, exactly? And what could what can be better than that? Exactly. I mean, we're not making hubcaps and widgets, and uh, we're uh, we're having fun. So, Jane, thank you so much well, for thank you. joining me, and uh, you're great. I love you. Best to Steve. <laughs> <laughs>
telling hey, Bob. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Take care of Ohio, my home. Yeah. Well, we're trying to. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see how the next couple of days play out. In the, yeah. There you in go. America. There you go. Okay. Well, as Dolly says, brighter days are ahead, and uh, <laughs> you know, try to stay optimistic. I know it's challenging, but we will. We we will. We will be back in a big way. Well, when so. you see Dolly and Ted, tell them hello. I'll and if you see Pete, Pete and Jack, give them my best too. Oh, okay? I will. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.